Hello everybody, welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. Today's watch is the winner of the most recent viewer poll. This is a 1976 Seiko model 6138-8039, also known as the John Player Special. I had posted a couple different options for watches on the community page and left it up to the viewers to just see which one they wanted to see next. And thankfully this is the one that won out. I'm certainly glad that it did. We're going to start off here just doing some function testing. And the first thing I'm doing here is just trying to see where the date rollover actually happens. And right there, right at about 12 minutes past midnight, the date wheel rolls over. And I think we can do better than that. Um, you know, I typically, I like to get these things at least within a, you know, five to preferably fewer minutes before or after midnight, but the quick set date seems to function just fine. And the quick set day right there functions fine as well on the 6138 movements. You can quick set adjust the day or the date, just depending upon which direction you rotate the crown in the middle position. But here we're going to go ahead and stop and reset the chronograph and see what that looks like. And that's pretty darn good right there. The case on this thing looks to be in original condition. It does not appear to have been repolished at any point. All the, the lines are still very crisp. There's definitely some scratches and some wear as one would expect with a, from a watch of this age, but it doesn't appear to be refinished and or repolished. So I think I'm going to just leave it alone. Normally, if a case has been worked over pretty hard, I don't have much issue repolishing it if I think it suits the look of the watch. But on this one here, I think I would be doing it a disservice by doing it. So we're going to leave this one alone. And as you saw me showing the bracelet there, that bracelet is certainly not original. And we're going to address that. So here on the time grapher, I put a wind in it and we're just going to get some initial readings. Uh, it is running pretty quick at about 50 to 60 seconds fast per day. Amplitude's low, beat errors out of whack. Um, th th those results are just pretty typical of a watch needing to be serviced. And as you see me taking the bracelet off here, there we go. These spring bars that are in this actually look almost brand new. This watch was pretty clean. Uh, I bought it off eBay about, I get four to half to five months ago. And the, the seller I bought it from did not make any mention of it being recently serviced or anything. But I think someone has been in this watch within, a, you know, somewhat of, a, you know, not too terribly long ago. Uh, as you can see here, when we pull the case back off here, which you'll see me do, the movement looks to be pretty clean at first glance. And I remember sitting at the bench here right at this moment, looking at this thing and saying, wow, you know, that actually looks really nice. The uh, one thing you normally see a lot of is there is a tension spring around the movement ring that the case back presses down on and it creates some tension between the two. And that's a common, I mean, the first thing you see to start to degrade or rust is that spring. I think it may just be the alloy that they make it out of. Not really sure, but that one is flawless. Whether it's been replaced or not, I'm not entirely sure. But, I mean, in this shot here, I mean, that movement looks super clean, which I was kind of surprised by. As we dig deeper into this watch, we will find certain things that are wrong. Um, certain things were were clean. Uh, when we get to inspecting the jewels, you'll definitely see. But, you know, if they serviced it, they did not do a very thorough job by any means. So, I mean, this thing is due for a complete workover, top to bottom. But uh, again, the, the outside of this watch, I mean, I've always wanted a John Player Special. I honestly didn't care what shape this watch was in. I wanted a John Player Special. I've wanted one for a while. And so the dial on this thing is, I mean, the, the selling point. I mean, that's why I saw it. I was hoping and praying that it was original on the eBay listing. So uh, that's what sold me on this watch. As we take apart the automatic works, that there is the transmission wheel. And you can see some gunk around the edges of that wheel. Where, you know, again, normally the movement's this clean looking, you wouldn't see that on there. But uh, it's just little things like that that we'll notice. But after that automatic works has been removed, we can remove power from the watch. So you saw me taking the wind down of the mainspring and the balance come to a stop. And now to remove the movement ring, you have to push in both chronograph pushers, as you see here. And then we can remove the movement ring from the watch, that movement ring retains those pushers. So when you pull the, when you remove the movement ring, be very slow releasing those, those pushers. Otherwise they can spring out. 
But speaking of that, see how nice that movement looks. And now take a look at these pushers. They're in terrible shape. Although the gasket on that one did not look terrible. And take a look at this spring. You could have, if they worked on this watch, they only worked on half of it because I mean, take a look at that. And the other one here is, is, is definitely, it's not any better. So we're going to go ahead and pull this thing out. And you see that, I mean, aside from the obvious spring, that, that gasket, it almost looks like there, it almost looks like there's two of them on there, just the way the light hits it. But the gasket's not, doesn't look to be in bad shape. It had been addressed. But then we, when we pull this stem out, Take a look at the gasket on that. Then that's what an old gasket look. I mean, it's flat and brittle. These usually come with D shaped gaskets and that thing is just hard as a rock and flat. And so that, you know, they changed out a couple gaskets, but not all of them. You can see that case looked great, but in the recesses where those pushers are, you can see all kinds of dirt and grime and it looks like rust. But uh, again, that's just kind of the enigma of this watch where certain things just don't make sense. So as we remove the movement, and the watch from the case here, you can see on that minute hand, there's some paint missing on the tip of, you see that black mark there on the tip, which we'll address that later. So we'll remove those hands. These can be notoriously difficult to remove. So those things kind of popped off once they released. And now I'm removing the subdial hands and they're wanting to stick to the, my plastic here. So I'm trying to be very careful and noticing where those are because I don't want to lose those. Here comes the second one. And again, it's just sticking to the plastic and I lost a hand once that way. It took me forever to find it. So always make sure that when I pull those hands off, they're on the dial when I pull that plastic away. So in order to get those off, I don't want to take a chance on scratching the dial. So I'm just going to tip it over and just kind of pour those hands into my little holder. But take a look at that dial. That thing is just phenomenal. There's a few pieces of dust on it, but those come off real easy just with a puff of air with some Rotico. So there is two dial feet screws that I'm loosening here and I'm just putting in a screwdriver and just lifting away the dial very slowly, very gently working my way around this watch. Uh, this thing's been on there for a while and that kind of gold colored trim piece that is around the dial that can be removed on these. But if you're servicing one of these, you, there's really no need to, I mean, it, so I just, I just keep it together as a unit. There's really no need to separate them. I don't want to have to bother with, you know, putting those back together. So here we're taking a look at the dial first, and you can see from the date code on that, that is from July of 1976. The first digit is the year. Second digit is the month. You have to know the decade, and these were made in the 70s. And on the case back here, that has 60, even though it's kind of hard to read, that says 68. So that is 1976, August. And as is typical, you know, you may see one to two months separation between those, but that is an original dial and, you know, folding money suggests, you know, it's a good bet that that is a dial's original to this case. Everything lines up. So we're going to remove this dial spacer here, which is really affixed to this. This is, you know, just held on there. There's no screws holding this down. It kind of sandwiches between the dial and the movement. That plate was on there pretty good. So we, we got that off. There we go. And now we can begin disassembly of this watch. And we're going to start off here just by putting some plastic down and pulling this pin out, removing this pin that holds down the day wheel. So I just keep a bit of plastic on there just to keep that spring from, for that little C clip from coming off. Again, it doesn't make for the best video, but it's the safest way to do it. So we'll go ahead and get that pulled off here. And I drop it. <laughs> You'll see in this video, there are sections of it where, you know, whatever day or whatever time I was working on, on this watch, it's one of those things where I've said in other videos where I've got some shaky hands and uh, uh, there's portions of this video where it's pretty bad and I clearly needed to get some food in my system or something. I should probably keep a, some sweets or some candy bars or something <laughs> near the bench to get some sugar in my system because uh, sometimes it's clear that I need it. So what you're going to see here is, and the reason I kind of kept this whole footage in some of these, there is a good number of screws in this watch that were in just way too tight, way too tight. I'm, I'm amazed that I actually didn't break any trying to remove them. But that last one you saw was right at about the limit of what I felt comfortable force. I felt comfortable applying before we started using other means, but it did come off. But I did make sure when I first started encountering these that my screwdrivers were all dressed properly. 
because it is really easy to tear up some of these screw heads, start marking on them at minimum or worse, just completely destroying them. But uh, make sure your, your, your screwdrivers are properly dressed and you know, you can avoid as much as possible, you know, damaging this, especially on those you got to put some force on to remove. And, you know, ideally you don't want to damage anything. That's the goal. But um, having properly dressed screwdrivers definitely helps that out. So on here, this is the final cover plate that we need to remove before we can pull off that date wheel. And we'll take your time there, Adam. There we go. Took me forever. But now with that out of the way, we can remove the date wheel. There we go. Next up here is the uh, calendar works. And this is all just one screw. Nothing super complicated about that. If you've watched a lot, some of my other videos, there, there's variations of this calendar work system. And it's, I mean, they're, they're super simple. Uh, just three parts and a screw here. Uh, that there is the, the day finger uh, that moves the day wheel around. That is what indexes the date wheel. And that is the driving wheel. And there you go. That simple on those. There's one intermediate wheel uh, as well, but that's on the other side of this chronograph plate that we're removing. And this plate here just kind of separates the, uh, you know, the rest of the dial side move uh, the parts for the, on the underside of it has the hour recording wheel chronograph parts and the keyless works and uh, just separates that from everything else above it. So we're going to go ahead and pull this off here. There's three screws holding this down and we can kind of move on with the rest of the, the disassembly. And while we're doing that, there, I wanted to state there's one other, oh yeah, here, there, that screw was there was pretty tight too. Uh, there's one other video I have on this channel that has this movement, and that is the bullhead video. That uh, I'm pretty proud of that video. It, it kind of seems that lately, just kind of looking at these YouTube analytics, you know, I'm new to this, but it, it uh, actually, before I say that, I want to point this out here. As I'm removing this calendar plate, do not do what I'm doing here because I'm doing it horribly wrong. You need to lift those wheels straight up. And as you saw, and it breaks my heart watching this, um, if you don't lift it straight up, you take a chance on bending or breaking the uh, the pivot on that our recording wheel, that wheel that I have in my tweezers right there. That, need, wheel, that plate needs to lift straight upwards. And I did a very poor job of doing that. I think that's worth mentioning on here. I, I do a lot better job reinstalling it later. But uh, just as I take apart the rest of these parts on this dial side of the movement, uh, I'll do the our recording wheel here and uh, during reassembly, I'll kind of go into detail on these parts here. But to what I was saying earlier was there's that, that bullhead video uh, that I have on the channel. It um, seems to be one of the more popular ones that, uh, you know, at looking at just which watch, which videos get viewed per day. And uh, it's kind of one of my favorite watches too. So in that video, uh, I, I briefly talked about how there's multiple ways to assemble this 6138 movement. And there's positives and negatives to doing it both ways. Whether or not you want to assemble the dial side first or the the rear side first. And there's pros and cons to doing that. The way I like to personally do it is I like to assemble ooh, one more thing here real quick. If you if your chronograph is in the running position, uh, you won't be able to pull that part out. And I'll you know I'll kind of show you later, but there you see me basically hitting the, the start stop button, basically stopping the chronograph. And then now I can remove that part out of the watch. There's an arm. You can see there that long post that goes on the other side that connects with the second coupling lever. And if this chronograph is running, the coupling lever is pushing against that arm and you can't really pull it out. So that's what that was. So the way I like to assemble these, I like to assemble the dial side first with the parts you see me removing now. Um, it, it, it makes for a few different things to be easier. Um, especially, you know, as, uh, installing that chronograph bridge or the chronograph plate, there's all sorts of positives for doing it that way, but there are some negatives also. What I'm doing, going to do in this, in this, for this watch, it's going to be on the second video because I had to split these into two videos just because I mean, my computer couldn't handle all this footage in one video making it. Um, I, I assemble this watch in the opposite way. And we'll talk about during, while I'm doing that, you know, the advantages to doing it that way versus the way I do it in the bullhead video. But I thought it might be helpful. To, I know some of y'all have kind of reached out to me either with questions or just kind of having conversation back and forth 
about watches you're working on, or, you know, you're asking me why I do one thing a certain way. And I know you're kind of watching these videos and doing your own. And I, I think that's fantastic. I love that. And that's one of the main reasons I started this channel. But, um, you know, I don't want you to think that, you know, the way I do it's the only way to do it. It's most certainly not. It's just the way I do it. But I'm going to do this watch in a different manner. Um, not the way I particularly like to, but it is another way. And certainly some accomplished uh, people who, you know, do this kind of work for a living. You know, I've seen videos where they do it in the way that I'm going to do in this video. But uh, I just thought that was worth pointing out. And, uh, you know, I was, I was taking that part off. It kind of popped off on me. So there we go. That There's that plate. And here's that tiny little screw that popped off. <laughs> I, had to I had to show those. Uh, but yeah, so we've kind of covered that. Uh, we'll kind of talk more during the reassembly on, uh, you know, advantages of doing it this way versus the other way. But the, you know, my personal opinion, when I'm build when I'm rebuilding these, just, you know, not on video, just for whatever reason, watches I own or ones I'm working on for folks. Um, I do it in the order that I did on the bullhead video. But again, this video here just shows you another way of doing it. So taking apart the Kios works and on the setting lever spring, I'm taking those two screws off there and I'm just, again, making sure that they're not different by any means. And I should have known I've worked on enough of these, but I've also worked on a lot of watches since my last 6138. So just taking a mental note at that point in time, making sure that those two screws are the same or making note if they're different. Here is the yoke spring. So I'm just going to kind of encompass it in some Rodico to remove it safely just so I don't lose it. There we go. This next part on here is one of the smallest parts on the watch with the longest names. That is the day date corrector wheel rocking lever. <laughs> and uh, that there's the yoke. And we have the setting lever to come out. And well, if I can get it, strike one. Yep. Strike two. Yep, strike two. One more and you're out. Oh, I'm out. Well, there it is. Setting lever. And that post on the other side, that's the, they call it the setting lever axle, but that's what you press on to remove it. That there's the winding pinion. And lastly, here is the clutch wheel. There we go. So after that, we flip the movement over and we can begin disassembly of the rear side of the movement. First thing to come off here is the balance. Just want to get that off safely and out of the way so we don't damage it. There is two screws holding this thing down. So we'll go ahead and get those two pulled off. This is awkward. Just silence. Still pulling off balance screws. <laughs> okay. No more weird silence. Balance screws are off. And we're going to go ahead and just kind of, I get my screwdriver in here just to kind of break any, you know, tension or hold that's on there. And then I can get my tweezers in here and just very gently lift this balance off here. Very slowly, very gently. There we go. We're going to go ahead and take a look at this thing under magnification and just take a look at that spring first and make sure all the lines look concentric. Uh, I'm actually viewing this. It's not, the microscope's not directly overhead. It views at about like a 15 degree angle. So, you know, it, it may look a bit off kilter, but uh, it's actually pretty darn straight. That That's that's actually looking pretty good. Um, you know, the roller table jewel looks to be, you know, straight and in place. You know, there's nothing really obvious that's, you know, wrong there. So pretty pleased about that. So we want to pull off this chronograph bridge next. And the first thing I like to do, you saw me just release and move that hammer click spring out of the way that kind of pulls tension off of this thing. So when we pull these screws out, that plate doesn't pop off. Um, you know, it wouldn't really damage the plate so much, but the, there, there is a couple wheels with pivots, you know, in there that I don't want to take a chance on anything popping off. So I like to just move that spring out of the way first. So now those three screws come off and that plate just simply lifts off. Here we go. Pretty clean. You know, like I said, there's, some of the things in here, I'm like, and that jewel was pretty clean. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Someone had cleaned this thing, but they didn't clean everything. You'll definitely see later. That there is the minute recording wheel. That looks pretty good. That's the intermediate minute recording wheel. Those things can be a bear to get, you know, lined back in properly. 
Now I'm going to remove this uh, operating lever spring. This spring puts tension on uh, the, the start stop uh, for the chronograph. The other side of that spring connects to the second coupling lever. And I use my finger there. It's just the technique I like does not again, make for a great video. So uh, I'm using my hold down tool on this one just to, so you can kind of see it a little easier, but generally not the way I like to do it, but it does make for uh, you know a better viewing experience. So there we go. Now, once you get it off those first two, uh, the tension's really gone. Then the, the, that, that post, that spring goes around four posts, but the last two, there's really not much tension there. But after that spring's gone, we can lift that hammer out of the way. And now we can remove the coupling levers. And again, here this, here's another screw. That is the screw for the first coupling lever. And then that one was on super tight. But I managed to get it off without breaking it. So that's always a positive. So as I fumble here, trying to remove that screw, here we go. This here is that second screw. And this one here has a special shoulder on it. So again, I think I've pointed out in the other videos where I've, we've had these, that is a screw that is unique to that one position in the watch. That shouldered screw uh, will only function right there in that one spot. But that holds down the edges of those coupling levers, but doesn't actually, it keeps them from lifting up, but doesn't put pressure down on them. So uh, it allows them to move, but we'll go ahead and pull those coupling levers off here. Off here. And can I want you to see me taking the rest of this off? This here is on the back side of this watch is basically, you know, the same as both, you know, the Pogues and the, the Bullhead. Um, variants, variations between the A and B series, like this plate here is on the, the A variation uh, of this movement here. Uh, that is the, it, that covers the escape wheel and the third wheel jewels. And that has the, uh, the bushing for the lower pivot on that intermediate minute recording wheel. This may have been actually the tightest screw in the whole watch was the screw for this uh, column wheel or pillar wheel. But you know, why you see me taking this apart here, uh, this John player special, uh, you know, it, I, you, you don't see a whole lot of these around it. I think, I think it's unfortunately one of the lesser known, uh, chronographs from Seiko from the seventies, which, you know, my it, personally, I'm, I think these are about my favorite watches is, uh, you know, the seventies Seiko chronographs. Um, I do have my eye on a citizen bullhead, uh, to do at some point, but, um, these Seikos, they just, they're just a personal favorite of mine, both the movements, which I thoroughly enjoy working on. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of people who do these and I don't think they're actually terribly comp terribly complicated once you understand how they work, but they're ultimately serviceable. Um, but yeah, it's just a, something about them, but these John player specials, you don't see a whole lot of them. Um, I didn't, there, there's a few videos on YouTube talking about them. I didn't find any really, you know, service movements on them here. Check this barrel out here. So this one here still has the bushing in it. It hasn't had the jewel upgrade done. And you can see the, you know, the, 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 side shake on that is just, uh, that that's definitely due to be repaired. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do a jewel upgrade on this, on this movement. But I think that these John player specials are among the best looking of all those seventies chronographs. In my personal opinion, the case on these is uh, rather small compared to a lot of the other ones. Uh, so this John player special is a 40 millimeter case with, uh, unfortunately 19 millimeter lugs, which makes, you know, bracelets and all that a bit more of a challenge, but yeah, we'll, we'll touch base in the second video on how we deal with that. But you know, the, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a wearable watch. It is kind of thick. It's a 14 millimeter thick, but it's not terribly huge. These things are sometimes known as barrel cases because of that, because their thickness to, you know, to width ratio, but you know, they, they, they wear great. They're just unbelievably good looking. And I think one of these days I'll just do a quick video showing the size difference between this, like the Pogue cases, um, like the, the bullhead. I was surprised when I got my first one, how small it actually was compared to like a Pogue. For example, the bullhead is significantly smaller. This watch is smaller than the bullhead, but like if you have one of the UFOs, um, like the 6138, 0010 or 0011. I have an original proof dial 1970 uh, UFO. That was actually the first one of these I ever worked on. The first Seiko chronograph I ever did was that watch. And I've still got it. 
uh, that's a big watch. And, you know, uh, I, I haven't run across one that's larger than that yet. Although, you know, I, I would like to see, get some of the, like one of the helmet models of the, you know, the star Wars refer to those star Wars ones, the, the, the black one or the white one, like the Stormtrooper or the, the Darth Vader watches, uh, the, the really odd K shape on those, uh, but, uh, which, you know, again, th there's a lot of variations of these, but this watch is on the smaller side, but I mean, a lot of people can wear this and pull these off and I don't think they get the credit they deserve, but they only made these watches for a very short time in the mid to late seventies. Most of these I've ever seen are 1976 or 77. I've seen one or two places that said they had one in 79. I have no reason to doubt that. I've just, you know, I, I wonder if the, the, case back is correct or whatever, because I mean, most things I find are 76 or 77, but I know they made these for two years. They may have made them for more, but if they did, it's not much, but they call these John player specials because if you, the 1976, um, F one Lotus racing team was sponsored by John player cigarettes. And, uh, they had these gorgeous golden blue colors which this watch kind of mimics um, and in, in the mar in their marketing at the time Seiko, although there was never like an official partnership, they never mentioned John player special in any of their marketing or anything. Yeah. It's pretty clear the way they advertised them and everything else. They, they modeled this after that Lotus racing team. Um, and uh, it's just, I think one of the most underrated watches. I mean, I, the people that know about them, love them. The few, you know, the, the people that have seen this, that have asked me about it since I started wearing it, since I finished it a few days ago, you know, have, you know, asked and all that. And I mean, people notice these, this watch, it's gorgeous. Uh, they just didn't make them for very long. And, um, you know, finding good ones could be a challenge. So you saw me disassemble the rest of the rear side of that watch here. And we're going to go ahead and pull this barrel apart and get this mainspring out. So I'm just kind of, I'm putting it on my bench block there and pressing down on the edge of that thing to separate the lid from the barrel. Then I just use my tweezers here just to work around a little bit and just make sure I don't pull off in an angle, just to get that thing to separate cleanly. There we go. This kind of comes apart there. There. And you can see on these that that lid's got that kind of gear assembly and there's a spring assembly in there. And that's actually what drives that hour recording wheel. So we're going to go ahead and pull this Arbor out here. Just like that. I'm holding the spring down while I do it. Just trying to be careful. And I'd lay that on its side and you can kind of get a little bit of a view of, you know, the, the, the hook on that Arbor. And then I'm going to go ahead here and just kind of show you, I won't show the whole spring coming out, but this is just how I generally like to start them. I use my brass tweezers so I don't scratch anything. And then I just barely get that spring out here and I just bear, you know, begin to work it around right now. There's not really enough to get my thumb underneath it you know, to unwind it. So I'm just slowly, slowly working that around until I have just enough to get my thumb underneath it, just like that. And then I'll just start to rotate it around and unwind it. And right here, when I get to the very end, I'm kind of keeping my thumb over it just to kind of keep that bridle assembly and all that from really popping out of there. So I'm just slowly working that around till it finally separates. There we go. And man, that spring is filthy. Take a look at that. So here we're going to inspect it just to kind of see the shape of it. And it doesn't look too terrible, but there is kind of one bend in it. It's not perfectly flat. You'll see here on the, on the coil end here, you know, see how it kind of raises up there a little bit here. I'll press down on <laughs> the springs actually so filthy when I press down on it actually sticks to my mat because of all the gunk on that spring. But here I'll lift it up here and you can see there's just that little bit of play in there. So, I, I mean, I can work that out. So I ended up reusing the spring. So now we're taking a look at the jewels and see how the jewels around that center wheel actually look to be in good shape. And look at the awful shape that center wheel jewels had. I almost thought from this view, it looked cracked. So what I'm doing here is got all my lights off and I'm shining a flashlight underneath the movement and then just looking at it through the microscope. And that looks like it's cracked um, and dirty. But see how different that is compared to the other jewels. And here's the other side of that. Look at that. The best I can tell, I mean, I've never seen such a disparity between conditions of jewels. I think what maybe the person who worked on this watch last maybe used S4, Seiko S4 grease as some sort of lubricant or something, because, I mean, you can clearly see the, the, the teeth on the cannon pinion and where those teeth were sitting. I mean, I've never seen that, that before. So I take a uh, piece of pegwood here that I've kind of shaped 
flat like a spade almost and i just kind of scraped the top of that jewel a little bit i mean then i needed to sharpen that pigwood up i've been using it to clean a bunch of other stuff but i'm just kind of getting a lot of that gunk out and i because i wanted to see if this jewel was cracked because i couldn't really tell it was so dirty and so once i kind of get one pass at it you know I'll, I'll shine a light underneath it again and you know it's looking a lot better but again is i'm like well is that another crack or is that just more dirt i'm not entirely sure so I clean it again. I'm using some Rotico here and I'm actually just pressing it into the other jewel holes in there and just kind of squishing that Rotico in. And I did that again. And now you can see that jewel actually cleans up. It's not cracked. looks to be in good shape. It was just, if that was lubricant, it's the wrong lubricant to use in that position. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things. And here's another thing I saw. I was inspecting this pallet fork and see, take a look here on the top left side of that exit stone. Uh, when I was cleaning off that would not come off. That's actually a crack in that jewel. So here I've got a new old stock pallet fork that I ended up buying after I did that last viewer poll winner, watch the blue poke where I used my last one. I had, I ordered another just to have, and sure enough, I already needed it this quickly. You can hear, you can see the old and the new pallet fork. So here, this is all the parts laid out aside from the screws, which I have, you know, cataloged according to their spot. So I'm going to go ahead and get these in. And I actually clean those screws. I'll put clean them in Rod if they're really filthy or whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll clean them in Rodico or, you know, if they, I don't run them through the cleaners just in a basket. Like I see some other folks do and then sort them out later. I don't like having to refine what screw goes to which position and all that. You know, I've seen some of these people do these movements. A uh, gentleman out of Canada who, uh, I haven't seen him make a video in a long time, but man, he, he knows these as good as anyone I've ever seen. But he just has every part just in one little bucket and he'll just sort through them all. And, oh, that's the right screw. Boom. And sure enough, it is, you know, but there's gosh, I don't know, a dozen different screws. So yeah, I'm, uh, I don't do it that way, but, uh, the way I do it, it may be a little bit OCD, but it again, works for me. So here, after I loaded everything up, here's me putting it in the cleaning machine. It goes through one wash in here. The first rinse cycles, five minutes. The last two I run for five minutes. And then uh, into the dryer, dryer cycle after that. And that's the cleaning. So here, this notch here is where you put in your case. Now that's how you can separate the bezel on these. I wanted to kind of show that. So what I'm doing here is just kind of covering the case in plastic. And I'm actually cleaning those parts while I'm doing this work here. So I use my cheapo, you know, case knife tool. I've actually got an expensive version of that tool. And I like the cheap one better. <laughs> but uh, with that done, we can, um, you know, separating it by putting that knife in the right spot, pressing in a little bit and getting that thing to separate. The bezel comes off quite nicely. There we go. Next here, the glass, the crystal that's on this thing, just kind of sitting on there. Uh, I mean, it's completely held in by the tension of that bezel when it's pressed in. But uh, I mean, that glass just sitting on top of that right there. Glass is in real good shape. It's dirty. Um, but, uh, completely reusable. It'll clean up. Then we have a crystal gasket that, uh, this here, it, you know, when I was looking at this, this is another Viton type gasket. It almost looked like an L shape, but when I removed it, it kind of took its original, original shape again. And it's a round gasket. When that crystal gets pressed in, it kind of formed an L channel in it. And this chapter ring here, there's also that this little, you know, uh, trim piece, that just you, it visible, you see one tiny little visible line when the watch is assembled that is that trim piece, but that thing can come apart here just like that. We'll go ahead and get those two separated. There we go. And now this chapter ring itself here. And one thing I want to point out here, just kind of with that arrow, see that little recess, that little notch cut out on the bottom side of that? That mates up with a notch that is on the outside of the dial where those two points kind of index together and that's how everything gets lined up. It's something you just need to pay attention to when you're reassembling. Um, so more on that in the, you know, when we put this watch back together. So this here is the case back gasket. And as you can see that gasket, now this is what a, a, a worn out gasket looks like. I mean, they're flat and brittle and you know, they break apart. You saw that thing break apart real easily. And this thing, I mean, if it's good gaskets are real soft and supple and malleable. So you can see just kind of, this thing just breaks apart into pieces just like that. So 
this thing gets new gaskets top to bottom. That's a really good shot of what a, you know, a gasket that's worn out on these looks like. So the case back here and the case had a little bit of corrosion on it. So just using some pegwood to kind of clean it. And I'm using this little fiberglass pin to g get rid of, you know, that surface rust in those little spots, the, the pitting in the middle still there. There's really no, once that's there, that's there. But those fiberglass brushes do a great job of getting rid of that surface rust. Uh, it's, you know, the main brand ones could be 20 or $30 or more. I mean, that one's just a cheap one. I think I paid like six or six or $7 for it. Does just as good a job. Um, I mean, there's certain tools that you don't have to buy super expensive, but, um, that case cleans up pretty well, just like that. Yeah. You just don't use those on the, you know, that will leave scratches if you'd use it on a, you know, a finished surface. So, you know, some people use those actually to kind of touch up brushing marks on case finishing. I've never really tried that, but those are great for getting rid of rust. This here is the minute hand. Uh, you may have saw when we first showed the watch here, it kind of had a little dark spot. There's some paint missing on it. I'm just kind of showing you my setup on what I'm trying to do to fix this. And that's, uh, my smallest paint brush was still too big. So I'm using an oiler here and applying the paint. That's like testers paint, the brand testers. Here, I'm going to second attempt at it. And I think the color match is pretty spot on when it dries. I mean, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's, it's almost a perfect match. The hardest part for me was, you know, thinking that, I mean, that right there, what you see is where I stopped at, but I was like, man, do I want to do it anymore? Because if you didn't know that that work was done, you would never know when you have this watch in your hands or looking at it, that that work was even ever done. But this way we were able to keep the original hand. And now here we're going to go ahead and do the barrel upgrades. Uh, the jewel upgrades for the barrel bridge. And so this barrel bridge here on these movements is uh, it's a bushing. So if you have the right size stump and pusher, uh, the stump's wider than the hole for the, the bushing. The pusher is a little bit smaller than the outside diameter. So we can just push it through and that bushing will fall into that stump. Just like that. Not much to these. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, use my tweezers here. What I like to do is kind of get these in and just kind of, these are press fit in. That jewel is 0 0.01 millimeters larger than the hole in the barrel bridge. So they're press fit in. They're held in by friction uh, or by tension. And so I'm just using the flat side of my tweezers here to press that in and just enough to where it doesn't move out while transferring it over here. I'm going to push it back in and try to get that jewel flush with the back side of that bridge plate. And I find that that's kind of a good starting point. I hear I'm just kind of getting everything lined up. So I'd like to take this opportunity to let everyone know I did recently start a Patreon page for this channel. The link you can see on your screen is also in the description. Had some folks sign up. I surely appreciate it. Uh, special shout out to Matt. He's uh, a recent, uh, he, he joined us recently on Patreon. He's actually, we've, we've talked back and forth on here and on Facebook. Um, he's got a, John Flair special waiting in the wings that he's going to be working on soon. He recently did his, his first chronograph, sent me some photos of it. He did a great job, by the way. Good job, Matt. And, uh, so he had voted for this John Flair special when the, you know, the vote, the poll came on. So, uh, you know, uh, Matt, I hope these videos, uh, you find helpful, but, uh, to people who join us on there, uh, you get a free sticker and a free welcome uh, packet in there. Uh, I do reg regular uploads, try to keep things new and fresh on there. And thank you so much for everyone that joins. It doesn't matter what level you join at. Everyone gets uh, welcome packets and all that stuff. So thank you again to everyone for doing that. So here I just assembled the this here because I'm going to check uh, in shake and side shake on this on the barrel. I just there's no spring in that just now. I just put the lid in the in the, in the arbor in the barrel assembly just so we can kind of test it. But um, got the in-shake set where I like it. Uh, so we're going to give it a shot here. That's There's your in-shake test right there. But uh, that looks pretty good to me. So we're going to give that a shot. But again, uh, next follow-up, the follow-up video to this will be a part two. My computer just can't handle all this footage in one video. It's not, you know, the world's best computer. It's not bad, but it's not great. So again, you can click on the icon on the left there and view part two, which is the full thorough assembly of this watch. Um, thank you so much for joining. I hope you'll click on that one and view part two. Thanks again, and we will see you on the next video.